Bom, acredito que já estamos ao vivo. É, eu gostaria de falar algumas coisas é, em nome da comissão do primeiro encontro de História da Arte da Unicamp. É, primeiramente, eu queria agradecer a todas e a todos que se inscreveram como ouvintes e comunicadores e também aos professores que aceitaram o nosso convite né, para participar das mesas e das conferências. Também eu queria agradecer a equipe da Secretaria de Eventos do IFIX, que está fazendo um trabalho incrível na realização de eventos durante esse período né, da quarentena, fornecendo todo o suporte técnico para as transmissões aqui no YouTube. É, essa seria a nossa 15ª edição do Encontro História da Arte, que por causa da pandemia foi adiada para o ano que vem, é, mas a gente não poderia deixar esse ano passar em branco, né? É, então, decidimos realizar um encontro menor, mas não menos importante, né? Que contará com a presença de grandes pesquisadoras e pesquisadores e que começa hoje, agora, com a fala do professor Geron, é, que gentilmente aceitou o nosso convite, né? É, via o professor Gabriel Zacarias, que fará a mediação, é, nós gostaríamos de convidar a todas e a todos a participarem com perguntas no chat, com comentários, que nós vamos passar para o professor ao final é, da fala. É, e sem mais delongas, eu queria passar para o professor Gabriel Zacarias, aqui do departamento, que vai fazer a mediação é, da conferência. Muito obrigada. Obrigado, Letícia. É, boa tarde agora já, né? boa tarde a todas e a todos, o, eu agradeço a todos e todos que estão é, trabalhando na organização do Encontro de História da Arte esse ano e conseguiram aí garantir uma solução né, para que, que a gente não deixasse de ter um evento, apesar das circunstâncias é, adversas. E agradeço ao Jerome Glissenstein por ter aceitado esse convite de fazer a distância, aí tem essa situação de de confirmar, né, fazer a sua é, conferência de abertura. O Jerome Wissenstein é professor da Universidade de Paris 8, ele tem diversos livros publicados, entre eles lá, no Instituto de Exposição, então, Arte, uma história de exposições, com diversas edições, já é um livro de referência para os estudos da história das exposições na França. Publicou também, nesse mesmo âmbito, é, outros trabalhos, como lá com a e a uh, Nova Anção de Curatel, né? então, a Arte entre as Linhas, que é um, um trabalho de estudo do aparato de mediação das exposições, é a invenção do curador, que faz um pouco a, a genealogia do aparecimento dessa figura tão é, importante na arte contemporânea, que se tornou o curador, né? inclusive a história da sua profissionalização. É, o Jerome é também editor de uma revista muito interessante chamada Marge, Marge, Revue d'Art Contemporain, que é editada é, na França, já faz anos que ele encabeça esse projeto. É, eu tive o prazer de trabalhar com ele nessa revista, editar alguns números junto com eles e coordenar alguns números. Né? E desde então tenho acompanhado o trabalho do Jerome, não tive contato com ele e já tinha um pouco no horizonte, né, aproveitar uma oportunidade para ter um convidado. Infelizmente, não vai ser de modo presencial, vai ser de uma distância, mas, de toda forma, a gente vai ter a oportunidade de ouvir. Jerome, uh, thank you very much for accepting this invitation. I'm going to, I have tried to present it the best I could, and now uh, it's, it's all yours. <laughs> ok, thank you. Thank you very much, Gabriel. I will share my screen now. Um, okay. Ah, this does not work. Oh, maybe. Um, okay. Now you you see my um, my PowerPoint. Um, so I'm I'm very sorry because I I don't speak Portuguese or uh, or Brazilian. My my speech will be in four parts. The the first one addresses the issue of exhibitions definitions. The second 
concentrates on a specific aspect of these definitions, producing objects that are bo both written and visual at the same time. The third is about the way the public sees and reads exhibitions. And the last part will be about the way contemporary artists challenge exhibitions conventions. So the, thir the first thing is uh, about um, the question of what an exhibition is. There are, of course, many possible definitions. Some of them are of uh, an anthropolog anthropological nature. Others involve sociopolitical considerations. Some are within the field of economics and others within the field of art. Hello. Oui. Sorry. Uh, je pense qu'on ne voit pas la, la, la bonne image. On ne voit pas ton PowerPoint. Ah. Vous voyez ton écran avec euh, notre... Ah. Je vais recommencer. Share screen. Fenêtre de l'application. Est-ce qu'on le voit maintenant? Do you see it? Ah oui, voilà. Ah, c'est it... mieux? On le, on le voit? OK. OK, so I, I just say it again. Um, the first thing I will deal with is, is are the definitions of, uh, of what an exhibition is. And um, there are many exhibitions, uh, definitions, many possible definitions. The, the one I will concentrate on is um, a definition of the exhibition as a meeting place, a set of relations between individuals, objects, and places, a situation involving three elements, the apparatus or device, what I call a dispositif, something that is used to present things, then the event of the exhibition, and thirdly, the experience of the visitors, the viewers, or spectators. So, um, oh, 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 I'm in the wrong, <laughs> I'm in the wrong PowerPoint moment moment i'm in the wrong powerpoint uh, no oh yeah okay it's it's the powerpoint okay so um again there this is an opening an opening reception of a uh, uh, very important exhibition, When Attitudes Become Form, in 1969, an exhibition curated by Harald Zeman, who has uh, become a legend of um, what an exhibition organization could be. Maybe I will get by to get back to um, this exhibition later. But the first thing I would like to talk about is what I call the apparatus, the dispositif of an exhibition. Here you have the, um, the, some images illustrating an article by Benjamin Ives Gilman, a museum director, the, the director of uh, Museum of Fine Arts of Boston in the United States. And um, in 1916, that, that's more than 100 years ago, Benjamin Gilman had the idea that the experience of visiting an exhibition should be uh, addressed um, as, as uh, an experience and not only as a display of objects. And in fact, when we visit a museum, we find normal to lower our voices, to raise our eyes, to remain a, at a certain distance from exhibited objects, to have some pauses, to listen or read information. We are not conscious, conscious, though, of the various devices used to produce a seamless visit. After all, we are there to see artworks and nothing else. Nevertheless, the display of artworks within museums constantly takes into account visitors' habits in terms of movement, orientation, visit, visiting time, listening competence, exhaustion, and it adapts artistic presentations to these parameters. 
Works of art are therefore continually transformed conceptually and technically in order to fit exhibition situations regarding framing, setting in space, lighting, links between artworks, movements of visitors, etc. So this article had a, a very strong influence on the organization and the designing of museums in the United States and later on other museums in, in Europe. Um, when I say that um, exhibition design is based on visitors' habits, I don't, I don't tell the whole story. In fact, museum's history shows that visitors had also to learn over time how to be museum's visitors in a kind of progressive domestication. Several points had to be clarified, and the, in the end, visitors had to learn how to behave proper, properly following a number of instructions. They had to learn how to remain silent, not to sleep on the benches, how to look at the pictures, not to run in the galleries, not to eat or drink. And this was very, uh, very important in France because the Louvre, when the Louvre opened to the public in 1793, it was uh, during the revolution and it was decided that the Louvre, the National Museum, should be open to anyone, which meant also uh, very poor people, vagrants, who took advantage of the museum, of museum's furniture and heating devices, and they spent their days in the museum. And they, they were allowed to stay in the museums, whereas in, in many countries, like in the United States or in Great Britain, the, um, the poor people were left out of the museums and were forbidden to enter the, the museums. That was something very interesting in France, the fact that you had to deal with what the visitors knew of the artworks and what they did not know of um, the visit of a museum. So it, it was never seen as something very natural, at least in France, because a, a, a good deal of the visitors were not professional visitors. They didn't even know what, what museums were, were there for. Um, in order to make myself as clear as possible, I would like to, to add a few words about the notion of dispositive that have, I've started using, a word that can be roughly translated in English by apparatus or by device. This notion is, is central to in the understanding of what an exhibition is, but also what a concert, music concert is, a film projection, a dance performance, or any artistic presentation in the public sphere. Dispositif is a French word that can be understood as meaning a plan, a medium, a machinery, a construction, a vehicle, or a situation. The notion was famously explained by Michel Foucault as being, I quote, firstly, a thoroughly heterogeneous ensemble consisting of discourses, institutions, architectural forms, regul regulatory decisions, laws, administrative measures, scientific statements, philosoph philosophical, moral, and philanthropic propositions, in short, the said as much as the unsaid. Such are the elements of the dispositive. The dispositive itself is the system of relations that can be established between these elements. What interests me here is the idea of an under underlying order of things, an order both technical involving things and verbal involving the language. To put it differently, dispositif relate to generic power relations and simultaneously to the way these relations are performed on a day-to-day -day basis. Dispositif don't say much about objects, but much more about the relation, the relations between objects, between objects and the way they are mediated and between objects and their audiences. Foucault's definition has been extended by many authors, among others by Giorgio Agamben, 
would define more specifically the dispositif as, I quote, anything that has in some way the capacity to capture, orient, determine, intercept, model, control, or secure the gestures, behaviors, opinions, or discourses of, of living beings. Interestingly, the notion of dispositif appeared at a very specific moment within theoretical debates of the 1970s when the concept of structure used by structuralists started being criticized and was about to be replaced by other concepts like multiplicity, apparatus, flux, machines, mechanisms, etc. The word dispositif is typical of that period and very quickly it started to be used also within the field of art, referring to all kinds of situations where objects are placed inside a specific context with some ends in view. It was particularly the case with art installations, performance, particip participatory or interactive art, video devices, experimental film. At that time, the word dispositif was very useful if someone wanted to avoid the words art or artwork that were too much associated with tr traditional practices. Dispositif would be the way to address complex artworks, exhibitions, exhibition design, or museum education. This word suggested the impossibility of isolating an object, an artifact, or an artwork from a space or context, often institutional, where a user's presence is anticipated. Dispositif evokes directly exhibition practices, inasmuch it is seen as, I quote, a way to dispose elements, a setting, a method, or a procedure. As French semiotician Jean d'Avalon once said, I quote, organizing an exhibition means to place the public in contact with objects. The ones who conceive and realize exhibitions arrange things, panels, showcases, objects, lighting, audiovisual material, walls, etc., in a place. This place, however, undifferentiated, it could be a simple volume or certain location, is always shaped. The designer, director of the exhibition installs, in the sense this word has in fine arts, a space. In an exhibition situation, a dispositif can therefore be seen as a multi-level system of relations. Relations between chosen objects. Relations between these objects and the place where they are displayed. Relations between objects and information they are associated with. Relations between people who organize an exhibition and the displayed object. Relations of an exhibition with exterior factors, the art world, artist careers, art criticism, etc. Relations of the members of the audience to what is exhibited. Relations between members of the audience inside a context, that is, within an, an exhibition setting. Here you have, for instance, a view of an opening reception at the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 1968, a very important and interesting exhibition. But you, in, on this picture, you can see members of the board of trustees of the Museum of Modern Art. And these are the people who are very important in the definition of an exhibition in such an institution as the Museum of Modern Art. And this you never see when you see the list of objects that were featured in the exhibition. The exhibition is not only a list of paintings or sculptures or any, any artwork. It's not, all, it's not only a, 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 not a place where the exhibition takes place. It's not only a number of visitors or a certain time when the exhibition um, was taking place. It is also the relations between all these elements, 
And that is something that you sense when you see this picture of people enjoying themselves, not only because they were seeing artworks and um, maybe understanding things or learning things, but also the fact that uh, you can see they had relations that had to do with something else as, as what you see in the exhibition as such. In my view, these positives establish and challenge the idea art forms are autonomous. One should avoid discussion, dis, discussion surrounding artworks without mentioning, mentioning the context where these artworks are experienced and addressed. Now, I would like to address a second important notion in relation to exhibitions, that of event. Exhibitions, festivals, concerts, displays, and all kinds of performances shape the experience of art. I believe such events play a very interesting role in the system I am beginning to sketch. Actually, they play two opposite roles. The first one is to establish and confirm leading or dominant opinions about the state of things. If you attend the Bayreuth Festival in Germany, um, it's, it, it's not only because it's, uh, it's, it's not only to, to hear a concert, to listen to a concert. The Bayreuth Festival has been for a long time deemed as essential regarding Wag Wagner's report, repertoire. Cannes Film Festival is the place where to discover major film productions. It's not only to see pictures. Venice's Biennale for Fine Arts is known to be the, the home of up-and-coming artists of various countries. To put it simply, our relation to works of art is mostly conventional. We rely on events produced by institutions hoping they will select artists worthy of interest. We will therefore credit anything that we encounter in such settings with a certain value. The other, the other important thing about the notion of event is its relation to time. An exhibition is not everlasting. It has a beginning and an end. It has spatial limitations. There is a number of things in it. The public is also limited and more important. After it has ended, an exhibition cannot re be revived in its original form. It can, of course, be displaced, as in the case of an itinerant exhibition. It can be remade later, sometimes with the original object, even in the same place, as in the case of the commemorative exhibition about Les Magiciens de la Terre. However, the new version is also a new event. The time cannot be frozen, which means that when we see a second version of an exhibition, it cannot be the same thing. When you see the Magicien de la Terre exhibition 25 years later or 30 years later now, it's, it is, of course, in a different context. You miss a lot of the context of the original exhibition. And it has to do with the fact that an exhibition is an event more than something that lasts a long time. After dispositif and event, a third notion originates in the idea that an event can, can't be reproduced. It is the notion of experience. To put it brief, briefly, Thinking of art according to the notions of dispositif and event leads to think artworks necessarily need specific forms of attention and anticipation from the part of their potential viewers. What the, the specialist of literature, Hans Robert Jaus, called hor horizon of expectation in the field of lit literature. This idea is reinforced by the fact institutional forms are of a changing nature as our taste and relations within society. This means that even though the general public has often spontaneously considered 
normal to watch works of art at a certain distance hung in frames placed on pedestals lined on walls or on the floor in large empty spaces accessible through grand staircases. This relation is no more natural than any other and is indeed the result of a complex history, what I would call an institutional shaping of experience. This idea can be well observed, for instance, in the project of Musée des Monuments Français, the Museum of French Monuments, created by Alexandre Lenoir at the end of 18th century, aiming at creating a total experience of past centuries in the minds of visitors. With Lenoir's museum, one was not only confronted by old artworks, one was embarked on a journey through history that was very much a kind of storytelling. When you had, um, for instance, you had some artworks of 13th century that had been saved from the destruction of an old church. And in the museum, they were replaced by um, an atmosphere of a church. It was not a real church, of course. It was a setting that was created by, Alex uh, by Alexandre Lenoir Le to give the visitor the impression that where they were entering a church. And in fact, uh, Lenoir, wanted to recreate the entire history of art according to settings he designed for the artworks he saved from destruction. You had a room for 13th century, another room for 14th century, 15th century, 16th century, and so forth. And every room was uh, an ambience, an atmosphere of, of the gone history of these um, artworks. It was uh, a story that was told inside the museum. Everything was fake. The, uh, the setting was fake. On, the only things that were real were some of the artworks, not even all of them. Standa standard, standardization of display procedures inside museums in the course of 19th and 20th centuries, a standard standardization we now frequently take for granted has often led us to forget that most artworks had other purposes before being shown to us. Museums, galleries, art centers, opera houses, concert halls, theaters, specialized magazines, art instruction, have strongly normalized the, the terms of aesthetic relations in time, their various dispositives being is implicitly presented as necessary pre preliminaries for any aesthetic relation. The best example in the case of fine arts exhibitions is given by the generalization of white spaces, the so-called white cubes, after the 1930s to display artworks, modern or ancient, or even for ethnographic objects. For instance, at the Ethnographic Museum of Paris um, that was um, started in, in, at the end of 19th century, where um, artworks or objects of Africa, Asia, in America were gathered and shown to the visitors as exotic objects. In the 1930s, with the influence of the art museum, the Ethnographic Museum of Paris began to have a room for the masterpieces of ethnography, which means something that had been rejected by ethnographists, like the notion of masterpiece, was injected inside the museum, the ethnographic museum, in order to convey a sense of art to the visitors. The visitors were not in any ordinary museum. They were in a museum where they had also masterpieces. I will now address the issue of what it means to have an aesthetic experience within a dispositif. This question is not simple. 
especially when one remembers that modernity told us to look at the artworks and not to look at their surroundings. We were told the artworks were autonomous entities and that what you see is what you see, to quote the famous sentence uttered by American abstract painter Frank Steller. The art critic Clement Greenberg said that what was important in an artwork was its pure visuality, and he, he was said to arrive blindfolded in artists' studios, fearing to be disturbed by unnecessary sights. In other words, the triumph of modern art implied to appreciate art in itself and for itself, regardless of its conditions of production, its original context or author. For this reason, modernity pretended that showing artworks on a white wall with an homogeneous light was sufficient to produce an objective aesthetic experience. At some point in the 1970s, William Rubin, who was then director of the Museum of Modern Art and a good friend of Clement Greenberg, had even the idea of removing all wall labels and placing only one painting on each wall of his museum, the center of which would always be 142 centimeters from the floor. The general idea was that the visitors would forget precisely what were the conditions of their meeting with the works of art. And indeed, after a while, this type of setting generated automatic reactions on the part of the visitors who, who knew what to do when they were in an art museum. Inter interestingly enough, when the, museum, when the Museum of Modern Art had a major reconstruction in 2004, the new curators decided to recreate the ambience of the MoMA and its heydays that is not in the 1930s, but in the 1960s. In fact, due to the assimilation by the public of the principle that an artwork is essentially a visual object, one always knows how to react in an exhibition. One observes carefully and for a certain amount of, of time, one tries to be absorbed visually in the space of the artwork. This functions most of the time unless one is confronted to an artwork of an unknown or new kind displayed in an inaccurate setting, not corresponding to what is expected in a given place. What you see here are rooms at the MoMA that were artificially recreating the ambience of, of the 1960s in the old MoMA. You had this new building with, with its huge, um, its, its huge um, rooms, and inside the huge rooms, they created smaller spaces that resembled the bourgeois, um, the bourgeois um, uh, apartments of the modern art collectors of the beginning of um, the 20th century. Um, displaying an artistic piece in a shop on the street, in offices, in a widely circulated newspaper, or on leaflets handed on the street, not only contradicts the, moder this, the modernist dictum, it also needs obviously supplementary instructions. How should one address the work? Is it necessary to observe it, to touch it, to express oneself verbally? Does one act or does one stand still? Very often, young artists believe they just have to hang their artworks in any place and anyone will be able to understand them. It is, of course, more complicated. Who says, who says the pictures will be understood, fully understood, or even seen? Here I show a, a, an exhibition by a group of artists on an open air market in Paris in 2006. It's just around the place where I live in Paris, actually. And I go to this market uh, very often, a few times a week. 
and I never managed to notice there was an art contemporary art exhibition in the market, even though I pass by every day. And that's that's because you don't expect to have an art exhibition in a, in a mark in a fruit market, and um, unless you you have a notice, unless you receive information about it, on the network of contemporary art, then if you don't receive this information, if you don't know there is an exhibition, then you don't see, you don't get to see anything. Okay, most of the time, in order to solve this kind of problem, explanations are added in the form of wall labels, leaflets, catalogues, what literary critique Gérard Genet called paratextual information. Paratexts are elements surrounding a text that facilitate its excess. Certain authors have applied this notion to exhibitions, remarking that artworks are in fact constantly surrounded by informative elements of all kinds, labels, press kits, orientation signs, catalogues, critical texts, etc. These elements give, give useful information. They act as mediation forms, even though they rarely explain what type of relation one should have with the objects or with the dispositif. Here, for instance, you have um, an exhibition of Pablo Picasso, the first major retrospective of Pablo Picasso in the Museum of Modern Art in 1939. And you see the display of um, Piero seated on the upper image. And then you have the same Piero um, in the catalog that's um, below, uh, below right. And then you have also um, the, uh, the, the captions on the label. And, and these captions tell a story that is being told by the curator of the exhibition, not by Picasso, of course. This type of information is sometimes given by the artists themselves. That's what art historian Jean-Marc Poinceau called authorized narratives or iconographic contract. I quote him. By iconographic contract, I mean the exact formulation of the terms of a minimal agreement that the artist would want to see being established with his interlocutors about what is to be seen in, in his artwork. Such a contract makes the use of an artwork as explicit as possible, pres preserving it supposedly from all kinds of misunderstanding. In turn, authorized narratives often lead to paratextual elements functioning as a user's manual, additional information or instructions allowing to get through to the understanding of its goals. However, most of the time, the efficiency of the dispositif, the good understanding of an artwork by its audience, is directly related to mediation strategies that is by choices not limited to those of the artist, but also those of the curator, the exhibition designer, museum curator, communication specialist, art critic, art instructor, etc. To sum it up, a dispositif is a superposition of several layers of information, ones conceived by the artists and others by mediators who act as intermediaries go between. The question of the limit between the action of an artist and those of various mediators of his work is far from neg neg negligible, even more so when one realizes that dispositif conceived by mediators always extend artistic dispositif, including their potential iconographic contracts, completing them, transforming them, contradicting them sometimes. Naturally, they also tend to set guidelines we have to follow. Is it then possible to escape or challenge dispositif hegemony? 
let's move further in order to see what the visitor's response can be. How does the public see or read an exhibition? Let's start with the common experience. We enter a place prepared to a certain extent to be confronted by artworks. We have been led there by all kinds of information, introductions to what was to be seen and the way it should be experienced. There we are, standing in front of artworks. We know their titles, we understand their issues and the way they operate. We know everything about the artists and their intentions. We know how to act. We know how we only have to play our part as visitors. What we actually endeavor, endeavor carefully. This situation seems strange though, as if we were blindly following directions without reflecting on them. Of course, one would always prefer to believe that the direct aesthetic relation, spontaneous, immediate, is preferable to a prepared relation. And one would like to believe in the universal access to old art of old times. Here we have an interesting dilemma. On the one hand, a dispositive can be seen as a whole able to determine aesthetic relations. In this view, institutional designations, guided tours, user's guides, labels, catalogues seem to be essential to the understanding of any artwork's goals. Otherwise, one would miss the point. One would not be able to really see something. On the other hand, conditioning reactions harms the chance meeting of an artwork, harms the surprise effect, and the feeling of freedom intimately bound to the pleasure of discovering an artwork on one's own. Contemporary artworks pose constantly this type of problem. They suggest new relations could take place and challenge the ways spectators discover art. However, most of the time, they can't escape being shown in the most typical of places, that is museums, art centers, and so forth, conferences, magazines. The main reason is that otherwise, they risk not, be, not being fully identif identified as works of art and not having their issues fully acknowledged. Of course, in order to escape this type of ambiguity, artists have sometimes considered leaving permanently the spaces of art, in, of art institutions while dissolving their art in everyday life. Others have sought to act, act directly upon the dispositif, mostly within art institutions, in order to deconstruct them, to highlight their mechanism. In the field of fine arts, Daniel Buren, Michael Archer, Hans Haake, and a few others, a few other artists associated with the idea of an institutional critique have since the 1970s and 1980s become specialists in the art of deconstructing the aesthetic or political conditioning of museums. For example, in 1999, Michael Asher decided to challenge the Museum of Modern Art's principle of not communicating about its deaccessioning by publishing a booklet listing all the works deaccessioned by the MoMA in the course of its history. And by doing so during the exhibition Museum as Muse. This was seen as a provocation and the exhibition's curator decided to express his views in the catalogue after Michael Asher's statement of purpose. This type of deconstruction has, however, mostly been seen by curators and museum representatives as a tribute given to their own practice of decontextualizing and recontextualizing artworks. And in the end, the centralism of institutions' actions has always been confirmed by the complex deconstructions they were experiencing. That's always the problem of institutional critique. It has been taken um, further by the museum them, themselves, but because the museums 
think it is very a, a very good thing that artists critique have a, a critical view of the museums and that the uh, museum like to entertain the idea that they are open to critique being conscious of the primacy of display dispositive over artworks leads however to a copernican revolution revolution in the understanding of what aesthetic relation is one tends to see the artwork as an element sometimes an illustration of a discourse and not the other way around discourses especially of an interpretive nature seen as ornaments of artworks it doesn't mean art critics curators or art dealers are artists that use artworks the same way a painter uses colors from his palette as daniel buren once said one has only to remember that artists are never, are never alone when they exhibit their work they are always supported by various means and all kinds of people with within larger strategies all of this explains the fact a film festival a concert or an exhibition could be see, could be seen if not like an artwork in its own right at least like a text having one or several authors and whose various elements provide a grammar syntax and vocabulary Canadian art historian Riza Greenberg summed it up this way in the case of exhibitions I quote for better or for worse exhibition has become a text a, spa a spatial text displayed in three dimensions a temporarily finished text with points fixing its beginning and end a thematic or narrative text a text that incorporates hegemonic or subversive met meta texts and in any case a text read by its onlookers seeing the various forms of mediation as texts using artworks should make us think again about discourses held about aesthetic relation why should we continue to speak about artworks as if they are autonomous disembodied entities unframed and barely accompanied by a few remarks by the artist don't we see that by doing this we are in the middle of a contra contradiction an artwork never presents itself this way to its audience but on the contrary always in very specific mediating context from which it cannot be that easily isolated the same can be said for any type of art be be it site specific installations or for video art body art or all kinds of participatory art organizing any type of mediation dispositif leads indeed to a sequence of choices on the part of art critics instructors curators exhibition designers etc all the people um, who uh, modify and and produce an exhibition and the, the all the choices these people make have consequences on the artist's own choices in an art event what is to be seen is never simply a series of objects but stage objects enhanced objects objects assembled in order to make sense one is concerned here with interpretations not in the sense of hermeneutics but in the sense of what act actors do and what people contributing to the organization of an event do and this type of interpretation can also be cr very creative maybe we should also see the better aspect of the subjection of artworks to their display dispositif temporary events instead of artworks far from being only operations transforming pre-existing objects could effectively be what would allow meaning making many making situations to take place within society in fact dispositif even though they are collectively conceived and hegemonic are not unchangeable even if only because they are read or at least practiced by exhibitions visitors 
conferences, audiences, magazines, readers. Here we can understand what Reza Greenberg meant by the idea of an exhibition as a discursive event, a model of exhibition where what counts most is what amount of discussion has been generated for how long in what sectors of society and most important to what effect. The last thing I would like to talk about is the play with exhibitions codes. This play can be done by museum curators or by independent curators. It can be also a part of an artistic project. It is particularly the case with contemporary art where audiences are on some occasions intentionally misled or deceived. In fact, it is rather common that in the art, in the art events, especially if we are talking about emerging contemporary art forms, contemporary music, dance, or experimental film, there is a cultiv cultivated element of uncertainty. Emerging forms are somehow uncanny. They resemble forms we already know, but at the same time, they cannot be fully understood and explained. To put it differently, the first role played by an exhibition, a concert, a theater performance is to establish and confirm the importance of objects already selected. The second is to regularly challenge the existing order by suggesting the addition of new objects to the canon. There are many examples, concerts by John Cage, Jean Tinguely's painting machines, non-dance performances by Jérôme Bell, participatory events organized by Alan Capro or Rikrit Tiravanija, Jeffrey Shaw's interactive digital spaces, etc. The only common trait between these projects is the fact they intended to contest the traditional relation to artworks using each time a specific display, a dispositif conceived by an artist whose function was to adjust the relation of the audience to the object. To some of these artists and other artists since the 1960s, the viewer, spectator, might be more active, critical and responsible, thanks to a new space given to him by the dispositif. He should no longer stroll between artworks, taking a quick glance at them. He could be part of them and become their privileged witness or even their co-author. Co this type of idea had some success at the turn of the 60s and 70s, at a moment when participatory art promised to challenge most traditional relations to works of art. Considering the history and legacy of display dispositif and the fact they are extremely diverse nowadays should be a starting point for any, any discussion about the relations between audiences and contemporary art objects, whether environmental, site-specific, perceptive, participatory, interactive, relational, or anything else. This said, is it doesn't change the fact that most emerging, emerging art forms are still displayed in frames, material or immaterial, that have been historically marked by the most classical of display procedures. Here you have um, a number of events organized by uh, a group de recherche d'art visuel, uh, an artist, contemporary artist group, of the 1960s who did participatory artworks where the experience was the base of the um, the the relation with uh, the artwork for uh, the visitors who will explain visitors at the musée national d'art moderne in paris the national art museum art museum that disney production walt disney productions by Bertrand Lavier, the paintings and sculpture uh, should not be seen as paintings and sculpture, but as simulacra. Wh what you have here are artworks that are not real artworks, which means they are real objects, but they are inspired 
by uh, comics of the 1940s um, where Mickey Mouse was going to the, the art muse modern art museum and so strange paintings and sculptures and the paintings and sculptures of the comic book of the 1940s were produced as artworks in their own um, in, in their own legitimacy by um, Bertrand Lavier 40 years later. Who will explain people they are allowed to eat the soup left on the floor of a commercial gallery by Rikri Tiravanija in 1992? Or who will explain homeless people who are, were eating the soup that Rikri Tiravanija made at the Grand Palais in 2012? that it was a kind of participatory artwork. How, how does one know that displayed objects are ready-made or relational pieces? If one does not notice the importance of dispositive frames and conventional markers that allow common, commonly an aesthetic relation to take place, works of art proposing other forms of approach are at risk of being wrongly seen, wrongly understood, or even ignored. Rejection of contemporary artistic dispositif doesn't mean, however, that they fail as art, but that they fail to spark a relation adapted to them. It happens frequently when artworks are displayed in public spaces without ex any explanations. Conversely, one often notices that confronted to participatory art in a classical museum, visitors tend to act, act as if displayed objects were meant for contemplation. Sometimes they treat them as documents about the art artwork, some visitors even trying to enrich their knowledge by see seeking information about them. These attitudes come as no surprise when one realizes that visitors generally tend to adapt themselves to the circumstances of their encounter with art. If you have always been told you should behave in a certain manner, you will probably continue to do so indefinitely. Photographic documentation presented in a contemporary art center could be seen as an aesthetic objects, regardless of the content. And a contemporary dance performance in an ancient art museum could be mistaken for a slight disturbance. Of course, most of the time, this type of misunderstanding does not happen. If I go to the Musée du Louvre, it is in order to watch timeless masterpieces, which I find there in abundance. I take my time, I place myself right in front of the artworks, the masterworks, I read carefully all labels, I do not raise my voice, do not spit on the floor, etc. Now, if I go to a contemporary art center, I hold out my hands and grab the objects that are handed to me. I answer the questions I am asked without ever doubting their artistic character. I take off my shoes if I'm asked to. I try on sensors. I do whatever I'm told to do. To put it more distinctly, each time we visit an exhibition, it is the surest sign of our intention to confront artworks, following arrangements that are specific not to these works, but to the dispositive accompanying the, their display. Dispositive that relate to the institutions that host them and to the people who devise them. If we visit many exhibitions, we tend to interiorize this behavior. No one would dare touching paintings at the Louvre, and it is so obvious that the museum doesn't even need to place labels to explain the visitors what they should or shouldn't do. On the other hand, at the opening of um, the Contemporary Art Center of Palais de Tokyo in Paris in 2002, even though it looked very much like a squat or a construction site, one could see everywhere signs forbidding to touch the artworks. 
Thank you for your um, attention. Uh, I don't know if I... Thank you, Devon. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for this great, great presentation. Excellent. We have many, we have many things that could be unfolded here. We could discuss further uh, in each of the three uh, definitions you have presented, right? Uh, whether we are talking about the dispositive or about the event or about the experience. Uh, we have already some questions. I would just, uh, before reading the questions from, from the public, this is just something I would like to ask you. Um, thinking about um, exhibition histories as a field of study, right? You, you, you show to us today um, many examples coming from institutional critique or contemporary art of relevant experiments that artists uh, did that I think they were very important for us, art historians, to learn uh, something about art. But I think contemporary art was fundamental to show us that there was something uh, more than just the artworks and that the artwork, the idea of the autonomy of the artwork was indeed uh, an ideological construct, uh, construction. And uh, but uh, since we have learned that, we have uh, sorry, it's a bit noisy here. Since we have learned that, we have been working in different directions. So, like you said, it was kind of a Copernican revolution, right? To to learn that all this power tax and the, the setting, and all of that, takes part in the in in how we understand art. Uh, but we have been working with uh, these ideas for at least 20 years now, maybe a little bit more, I don't know, um, if we think, um, so uh, if we think about the development of exhibition history as a new type of, a new way of studying the past of art that takes in consideration all these different dimensions you showed us, uh, how do you see the development of that field, which is more or less settled by now? Uh, what have we gained and what have we lost from uh, in the past, let's say, 20, 25 years studying the exhibition histories? Yeah, I think that what uh, exhibition history um, brings to art history is the idea that uh, that an artwork is always inside a, a web of uh, relations, is always inside a web of relation between um, artists and um, curators and, and uh, exhibition and also museum curators, but also um, uh, art dealers, art critics, art historians, various uh, layers of the public, also all kinds of mediators, teachers, professors, and, and so forth. And um, that you can't take the artwork to be only um, a form, a certain form, which means regarding art history, the, the history of uh, exhibitions is, a, is a, a cultural history is a cultural, is a, a, like any um, um, cultural history. It, it does take the artwork inside the system, inside a general set of things. Then what uh, is interesting with the, the um, importance of exhibition history, um, that when you, when you organize an exhibition today, you organize, I mean, an exhibition of ancient works, you always have to choose which set and which context you, placed for, you place forward. Do you replace the artwork in a simulacrum of the original setting where the artwork was shown? Do you do what, what Alexandre Lenoir did, which is uh, creating fake context for the artworks? in order to show how the artwork 
was seen in the past, in the period when it was first made. That is what is sometime, sometimes done in exhibitions today, even for modern artworks, because modernity is already 100 years old. So when you, when you um, show artworks of 1920, do you show it in our world or do you show it in a recreation of 1920 setting? Very often, um, this question is uh, inside any exhibition project by art historians. In, in recent years, in, in the last 10 years or 20 years maybe, most exhibitions I see of ancient art try to address this question, the question of how to relate to old artworks in our world without ignoring the, uh, the cultural history of the artwork in its time, in the time it was made. So I think it has enriched the, the debate about um, res the restitution of an art context when you exhibit artworks of the past. That, that's the main, main thing uh, exhibition history has, has done to art history. That's, that's what I, I think. That's great. So let me have a look at the questions we have received. Um, I think, so Jose Carlos has asked, what is the impact of artworks that are displayed in um, public spaces to people who inhabit those public uh, spaces? I, I, I did not understand the question exactly. Yes, I think he means, uh, so you have shown the case that sometimes the yeah. artwork is displayed outside of the museum. And as you mentioned, I think sometimes we don't recognize that as art because it's not there, right? But if, uh, but still, it it is in the, it is there, right? So people who are passing by or who live there, or uh, what kind of relationship they establish with those objects? No, I have a, an answer to this question. I think that when you when you do an exhibition, when you organize an exhibition outside of the art institution in, in, on, the, in, on the street, for instance, or uh, anywhere else in, a, in an apartment or in a, in a shop, uh, then you have two type of audiences, the first audience and the second audience, try, uh, uh, two spectatorship. The first one are the people who see inside their everyday experience the artworks. For instance, when you had this exhibition on the on the market, on the fruit market, you will you would have people who do not know anything about art who come across artworks in their daily lives when they go on the market and they they find artworks and they have a certain type of relation. Sometimes they understand and sometimes they don't understand. They ask questions or sometimes they just pass by. And then you have a second layer of public, second layer of audience spectatorship. That's the people who see documents showing the exhibition on the market. Because of course, the artists who exhibit on the market take pictures, they, they make films of their uh, uh, activity on the market, and later on, they show in an art setting, in an art context, they show what they have done on the market or on the street or in shops or in any place that is outside the, the, the art world. What I'm saying is that you have two audiences. You have the audience, the public on the site in the, in the place where you did your exhibition and you have a second public later and in fact you address the artworks to the two publics at the same time it's a it's what we the linguists call a double address double address because you are um, 
speaking to two types of audiences at, at simultaneously. That's exactly what happens when you see an interview on the television, you see an interview by a politician who is uh, answering questions by a journalist. In fact, the politician is answering the journalist, is talking to the journalist, but in reality, he is talking to the, the people who are watching the television. <laughs> so that's the same when you have an artist, a contemporary artist, who makes an installation or an exhibition in um, any kind of, of place that is not an art institution, you can imagine that sooner or later, there will be images, documents, documentation of this event that will be presented in an art context. Uh, Isadora Mattioli has asked, um, how do you see, how do you perceive this uh, exhibition dispositive for the specific cases of the, um, the big biennials and the mega exhibitions of contemporary art? Well, the, a, a very interesting um, uh, thing is going on, has been going on in the, in the past um, 20 years or 30 years now, it's the multiplication of uh, bien biennial events, um, large scale exhibitions of emerging artists, of newer artists. On a global scale, you find um, uh, biennial exhibitions everywhere, absolutely everywhere in the world. There are something like a thousand art biennials in the world at this, at this point in every country. Uh, I don't know how many you have in, in Brazil, but you have a few in Brazil, the, the many in, in, in South America, even in Ushuaia, in uh, <laughs> the southern tip of South America, you have a biennial in Ushuaia. Um, you have, well, it's something that has to do with um, the global, uh, globalization of the art scene, of course. It has to do also with the multiplication of art fairs, also everywhere in the world, in every country almost, maybe not in North Korea yet, but uh, you have art fairs everywhere. Um, you have also, not everywhere, but more and more contemporary art institutions in many, many countries, and sometimes in very uh, unlikely countries. I've seen that there, were, there was a, a contemporary art center in Yemen and another one in Libya. And um, you have a, a contemporary art center in Mongolia. Um, so it's, it's, it's very, it's fascinating the way uh, things are uh, uh, spread everywhere in the world, which means uh, on the one hand, you can, think it's a kind of, of um, homogenization of, of art practices in, in, in the entire world. And at the same time, you have the development of local scenes where you have um, local, local ways and very specific ways of addressing the art objects and contemporary art. So you have local scenes and a very global phenomenon where you have the multiplication of biennials and fairs and everything. Very good. Uh, Fabrizio has asked, he says, um, when we think about exhibitions nowadays as a discourse, we usually attribute these discourses to the creators as being the responsible for the discourses. But how, how, are, how can we think about exhibitions in the 19th century, such as the Parisian Salons, where you don't have uh, curators as we understand nowadays? How can we understand this discourse, which is not so obviously constructed by one individual? But in fact, I, I tend to think that the situation is, is more complicated both ways. In, in recent times, we tend to think that an exhibition is organized by a single person 
the author of the exhibition. In fact, an exhibition is never uh, organized only by one person. It is always a negotiation between many, many players. For instance, uh, not curator will have to borrow artworks from collectors, will have to find money by uh, art galleries or student fun uh, or uh, state funds. So it's a negotiation to, um, to carry out an exhibition nowadays. It's never only the uh, idea of a uh, all powerful curator. The, the curators are never so powerful in reality. And in 19th century, it was also um, a collective endeavor because you had a committee, you had several committees. That you had a committee that organized the exhibition that was um, usually in two parts the people who were designing the exhibition, the exhibition designers who were to put up the, the show, organize the presentation of all these uh, very numerous paintings on the walls. It was a very interesting way of working because they had sometimes drawings, preliminary drawings, where they would place um, all the artworks according to the importance of the artist, also the social importance of the artist, or the connections of the artist with um, his pat patrons. And then you had the, the people who um, selected the artist, and also sometimes in 19th century, the jury that gave prizes to the some of the artworks. And um, the people who selected the artworks and the people who hang, hanged the pictures were not necessarily the same people. They were they were uh, members of, of the academy. They were members of of a society of artists naturally, but they they, were, they had different tasks. Um, the people who um, who selected the artworks related to um, the um, the uh, the norms, the general norms of the academy, which means uh, the way a painting was painted according to certain principles. If a painting was well made according to these principles, then it was to be selected. Otherwise, it was to be rejected. That was quite simple. Um, and it was a, a collective curating, actually. It was not one person, but five or 10 people or more sometimes who selected the entire show and other people who organized the, the design of the exhibition. Well, that's, that's one of the things you have already worked on, uh, showing how the, this figure of the creator was invented throughout the second half of the 20th century, right? And how it became a professional uh, type, right? Maybe not so much uh, prestige. We see it as very prestigious, but it's actually just, uh, now it's just another human being working with the world. <laughs> but in fact, you have two types of curators. You have curators for uh, fancy evenings where they can uh, show off their, their fancy clothes and habits, and and they um, they are parading in in uh, in openings and and shaking hands to important people, and then you have the uh, the other curators who organize exhibitions, which is not always that simple or or so nice. Sometimes it's uh, <laughs> it's quite boring also, and then you have to go through. Uh, loads of uh, administrative papers and, and, and write statements of purpose for any grant and, and um, you have to meet uh, important collectors and, and receive permissions, which is not so glamorous. But then you have both curators. You have the ones who, um, <laughs> who are very glamorous and, and um, are themselves exhibited and the ones who do the work. <laughs> um, also, uh, 
Anna Karajevito has asked about uh, the beginning of the museum, of the Louvre Museum, uh, if there are um, studies on the reception, of the, the public reception of that time, how can we better understand how the museum uh, uh, worked to build this sense of how to behave in the museum, etc. But in fact, um, very unfortunately, there were no visitors studies in 18th century. Uh, there were no visitors studies actually in France before the 1960s, <laughs> very late. So uh, more than a hundred years, or uh, yes, more than a hundred years, you had no no studies about Louvre, no systematic study of the Louvre visitors. However, we have some witnesses, we have some people who wrote about their experience of visiting the Louvre, and you have also accounts que chegamos a um ponto de problemas técnicos. Não sei se a gente vai conseguir sair ileso, né? Nós estamos funcionando, correto? Aí, correto. Tá é, acho que a gente vai ter que aguardar, então. A conexão dele é muito pontual, né? A gente falou que ele ia até uma e meia, voltou uma e meia. Queria aproveitar então para falar que às duas horas a gente tem uma rodada de comunicação. É, quem se inscreveu como ouvinte já recebeu o link, vai ser pelo Google Meet, então vai ah. ser fechada. É... Parece que ele voltou. Sorry, I was disconnected. I, I was um, disconnected by my uh, internet provider for some reasons. <laughs> So I, I, I missed something. You were answering the question about, you were saying that we didn't have uh, the study of reception in the past. Um, yes, uh, in the beginning of the Louvre, uh, we don't know very much about how the people behaved. We had some witnesses who wrote accounts of their visit to the Louvre and um, Usually they said that people behaved quite normally, but the problem was more with um, uh, simple people, people who uh, were um, from uh, the countryside or um, the poorer uh, people who came to the Louvre and they did not know really what were the paintings, why they were paintings at all. Sometimes, um, there, there was a, a, a story, interest, an interesting story of a military in, in Napoleon's uh, time. You had a, 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 a soldier who came to the Louvre with his parents and he showed the paintings that were stolen by Napoleon. And he was very proud of saying, yes, we stole these paintings for the French Republic or something like that. So the reason why people liked pictures were are strange, strange to us sometimes. Then you had also people who came to the Louvre because it was free and heated. And uh, you had poor people. I, I've seen, the, I've, I've shown the picture of uh, the poor people in the Louvre. And there were debates in the National Assembly um, about whether uh, one should allow poor people in the Louvre because poor people did not know how to behave. Sometimes they they came barefoot or with their, uh, their very ordinary wooden shoes and, and they were damaging the, the floor. And sometimes the, uh, the, um, the women came with their 
with their small children, with their babies, and, and the babies had to uh, relieve themselves on the walls of the museum. And so um, um, it was quite dirty. And also, um, you have all kinds of accounts of people who were lost in the Louvre because it was too big. There's a, a novel by Emile Zola where you have a scene of a wedding by very ordinary uh, poor people. And after the wedding, they don't know what to do. They decide to go in the Louvre, to have a visit of the Louvre because it's not far. And so they, they're lost in the Louvre and they spend hour, hours in the Louvre trying to find the exit. <laughs> it's, a, it's quite a funny story. So we have some accounts of how it, how it was for the, the, the first viewers of the Louvre, first visitors. We know, we know that there were quite many visitors from the, the beginning. From the beginning, it was quite popular. And you also had the Salon, which was uh, the annual or biannual um, exhibition of, of living, uh, living artists. So in the Salon, you also had some visitors, quite many visitors, which means the Louvre was never empty and there were quite diverse uh, visitors. Then we don't know much about what the visitors thought or what they said. We have only very, very few accounts. Uh, Gabriel, I don't hear you because you're mute. <laughs> of course, yes. <laughs> Class can stay. Okay, so Karen Philipov has written us a question here already in English. Every time we create an exhibition, we create a discourse in which the artworks become decontextualized. We create something that might not have been the original purpose of the artist. What is your, what's your opinion about that? I'm looking for the question. Uh, it's this one here. You see that? No. no. I don't see this. Um, it's in the private chat. Uh, on the private... No, I, I... I don't see this. Yeah, ah, yes. no okay. <laughs> Every time we create an exhibition, yeah. we create a discourse in which the artworks become decontextualized. Um, well, we, we, in fact, we deconstruct, we decontextualize the artworks, but at the same time, we recontextualize the artworks, which means we give a new context for the artworks. We take out the original context. Sometimes we try to recreate the original context, and most of the time, we create we create another context. We recontextualize the artworks. Um, and in fact, the question of the original purpose, what were meant the, what for were meant the artworks? It's a difficult question because most artworks in an ancient art museum were not artworks at all. In the beginning, they, they were not artworks. They had some function in a, in a, in a, a, a castle or in a, in a, a rich rich person's house or in a church and they had another type of function a ritual function or uh, um, um, a commemorative function something else Acho que a gente teve mais uma perda de sinal. É, proponho que quando, quando vamos aguardar um momento, o Japão consegue reconectar. Eu proponho que, que quando ele voltar, a gente responda a última pergunta e a gente encerre. Espero que ele volte e a gente possa encerrar com ele <risos> devidamente. Né? Não. Não. Lembrando que a lista de presença já 
foi enviada no chat. É, então, vocês precisam abrir o link e, e colocar seu nome lá. É, Para ter o certificado, é, precisa de 50% presente ele voltou sorry um, yeah. Yeah. ok um, yeah, I think I answered the question I hope I hope you heard my uh, my answer to, to the question I don't know when I was cut because um, it does not cut at the same time for me um, yes Yes, I think that's okay. I think probably we could have one last question and uh, uh, to finish right before we get cut again. Mm. Um, what yeah, else I, I, I yeah, yeah. Just I, I, I wanted to say one more thing yes, about please. the decontextualization de 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 question. When I was going to say, when you have the portrait of someone in a in a in a room. Uh, the painter made the portrait of uh, somebody and and it was maybe a gift to someone else and uh, some some day the the model for the painting dies and 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 another day the person who owns the painting dies and then the the inheritors of the painting die and then the painting is sold and two centuries later whatever the result you have lost the context and you 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 can always tell the story but you will always have lost the context which means you have to fabricate to create a new context that can be uh, very formal if you uh, place the painting on a white wall and pretend it's just it's just a painting uh, just a play of an artist or you can try to have some indication of what the context the original context was like but it's in both in both cases you have a, a you, you can't reclaim the original context it, it's gone it's gone so you have to invent something else recontextualize the artwork And thinking about uh, she had when she asked, she mentioned the, the original purpose of the artist. Right? Many uh, artists have tried to control that in contemporary art. That's the the idea of the receipt to receipt that you have mentioned in that concept from Jean Marc Marceau. Yes, and and there is an interesting case. It's um, Daniel Buren. Daniel Buren is an artist who um, who wants to defend his rights which means that when he sells a painting to or an installation to a collector the collector does not have the right to ex to exhibit his this artwork without the permission of daniel buren if the collector exhibits the artwork without the permission of daniel buren then daniel buren uh, sues sues the, uh, the 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 collector And he has sued a few collectors for this reason, and he always won the cases because he considers that an artwork that would be exhibited without the consent of the artist uh, would not be the artwork. But of course, one day, Daniel Buren himself will die. And what will happen with the artworks he has uh, sold to collectors <laughs> yeah, that's the, we had a discussion a couple of weeks ago with uh, Emeline Jarry, and she, she was talking about Philippe Thomas. That's the case, right? Oh, yes, he, he's of no longer there to control what he wanted to. So, part of the deal is off. No, no, it's a, it's a famous problem with uh, what I would call late modernist artists. Because in late modernism, people believed, uh, still believed, that there was an autonomy of art and a self-reflexivity -re of the artwork. And an artwork was about itself and an artist was autonomous and, and so forth. But um, I think this, this is, uh, is an illusion of uh, late modernism. 
that uh, is no longer va valid, even though you have people like Daniel Buren, but he is quite old now. And um, he's one of the, the last um, artists who think like that, who believe who that the artist should have all the rights over his artwork, even though it's not very realistic when you think about it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, okay, so to read one last question, Gabriel Simons has asked, you have mentioned that you have used the concept of dispositive, you have mentioned Agamben, who has also enlarged that concept of dispositive from Foucault. Agamben also has the notion of profanation, so she's asking if it's, uh, if you believe it's possible in this, the sense of profanation that Agamben proposes, if it's possible to profanate the dispositive of the exhibition, and if so, if that would be a, a political task of the, of the art. I don't think there is any task for the art. Um, the art is what the, um, the, the artist, but also the viewers and, and the, uh, the go-between people make of it. Um, I don't believe uh, there is any task for art in general. Um, then to go back to uh, the... Um, I, I'm, I'm not a specialist of Agomben, but I know that Agomben has um, has written about exhibition sometimes, um, and he's written also about a dispositif like Foucault. But he has a, a rather traditional, in my view, traditional view of what an art work is, which is um, what I call traditional is um, influenced by um, by uh, German philosophy. And um, and the idea that the the artwork or the artist um, uh, has a kind of ontology, something in in itself that one would uh, discover through um, a critique, through uh, interpretation. Um, and I believe um, I, I I believe that this type of uh, view is is uh, is is. It misses the point. Um, why it misses the point? Because um, the interpretation of an artwork is not something that comes after the artwork. It is something that is that participates in the construction of the artwork. Interpretation, even interpretation 200 years after the artwork was made, is part of the construction of the artwork. It's um, because I believe that an artwork is not only made by artists, but also by other people, among which art critics, historians, curators, galleries, and so on. And all these people contribute to the production of an art object, which means when you have an art object, um, thinking of the art object inside a dispositif is a way of negating the autonomy of the object because an object is never alone you can never <laughs> you can never see an object for itself it's that that's what i try to say actually i'm not some saying something else it's only that you can't see an object for itself <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, I think we can conclude on that one. Uh, Jérôme, merci infiniment d'avoir accepté l'invitation. Ça a été excellent, ça a été super. C'est un peu grand. <laughs> okay. Ouais, 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 voilà. Merci d'avoir accepté d'être là dans ton bureau. <laughs> Bon, Peut-être un jour, on va pouvoir avoir une, une vraie invitation de te voir au Brésil. Si on est autorisé à voyager dans, ah, le... dans le futur. <rire> Mais en tout cas, merci de m'avoir invité. Je suis un peu désolé de ne pas m'être exprimé en portugais. J'espère avoir été compréhensible. Et oui, bon, après, il y avait un peu de petites choses compliquées au début et, et des problèmes de connexion à la fin, mais sinon, ça va. Non, c'est pas excellent. Ok. 
questão mesmo. Sim. Bom, Obrigado a todos e todas que nos acompanharam. Acho que a gente pode encerrar a transmissão de hoje. Vocês logo mais, né, Letícia? Daqui a 15 minutos começam as comunicações à tarde. Isso. Muito obrigada, professor Gabriel, pela mediação. Muito obrigada, Jerome. A gente se vê daqui 10 minutos. Bom. Merci. <risos> ok. Merci. Bom.